Yeah. Great. Okay. I've got some little toys to hand around to people, but everyone's eating, so we're <laughs> not sure how that'll work. But um, just in case you wanted to have a look at them. So I'm here to talk a bit about um, thanks about the One Laptop Per Child program. We have an international program. Uh, I work specifically on the Australian program. So I'll give you kind of more of a preview of what we're doing in Australia, which is a little bit different to what they're doing internationally. Um, this little device is an EXO. So I'll talk a bit more about him during the talk, but I'll just hand them around in case I <laughs> um, pass them through if you're eating and don't really want to have a player. But uh, this is the uh, a little laptop that was developed for 100 American dollars each. So give you that. It's the first time I've done it when people are eating, so <laughs> it's not too much of an uh, interruption. So give you a little bit of talk about um, myself. So uh, Amy Marie Forstrom, I work in uh, open source web consultant. Couldn't find a nice picture of me, so you just get tux. <laughs> I work specifically in Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Have done for probably about six or seven years now. Been in the IT industry for about uh, 10 or so years. Um, so that's me there. The main company that I'm consulting with at the moment is One Laptop Per Child Australia. Um, didn't know I had to give a little bit of a background into me because normally I keep the background into me a bit brief. So I guess because I'm here in a room full of women and that, I'll give a bit of an um, explanation of that. So I actually started in the fashion industry, believe it or not. When I was 16 years of age and I was very technical, I was told, you should go off and be a pattern maker. So even though <laughs> I really enjoyed not doing clothing, I got thrusted into the world of pattern making and I worked in the fashion industry for about three years and ended up implementing uh, computer solutions for them because there was no one doing it at the time. And I was like, this is crazy. We're faxing all this stuff. We have a scanner. We can be emailing. And just started doing little things like that. At the age of 20, I was able to receive a scholarship in the area of network uh, administration. So I started working in network administration where I worked for about four years. Was privileged enough to work for companies like Inchcape Motors, uh, Merck Logistics, UBS Warburg um, Bank. Um, and I worked specifically actually then on Microsoft servers and Unix servers as well, so send mail and exchange mainly. Uh, after doing that for a while, my passion was always in programming. I did have a computer when I was eight and loved programming back then. So I decided to make the change and get into programming, which ended me up as a web consultant. <laughs> so a <laughs> bit of an interesting change there. But um, finally, I got to where I wanted to be, which was working in programming and in IT. Uh, so OLPC, that's enough about me. Uh, OLPC Australia, the mission. So the big thing about Australia is people go, but you're a really wealthy country. Yes, we are. But we're also 93, 94% desert. So we've got a lot of our population living in rural um, communities and remote communities. So the mission with One Laptop Per Child Australia is slightly different to the international mission. The, the international mission is basically about to get a laptop out there to help. Um, it's the same thing as in reducing a gap. It's to really help to kind of get a laptop out there so people can have accessibility to information and to level of education. So that's what we're doing in Australia as well. But what we've done is uh, we've done some research with some of the universities and we've targeted 400,000 kids that we find that are living in rural and remote areas. 80% of those children are Indigenous children. So that's, this is what we're doing. We're providing them with a purpose-built educational tool that's rugged, low cost, low powered and connected. So the little EXO that you see there is completely plastic. It's got a keyboard membrane that you can rip off and put back on, so you can do that for different languages. It can be dropped around, it can be dropped, it can be banged, it can kind of handle kids playing around with it. And also, these guys are, as I said, they're in rural and remote Australia, so most of it is desert, very arid land as well. So it can handle those harsh conditions and the heat that you get out there. So we have a focus on communities with a socioeconomic index below the national average of 1,000. Um, 
in so in Australia, what we have is when we're looking at the differences between our at the communities at a socio-economic level, they give it an, an index rating. And when you look at these communities that we're targeting, they're not just 100 points below the nat national average. They're quite a couple of hundred points below the national average. So these guys are really disadvantaged in regards to the access to technology uh, and infrastructure that they have. That's a photo of one of our deployments. Yeah. Oops. So how are we achieving this mission? Because it's a pretty big mission. Um, we've only just recently started. So there's five years and we in the first we just over the first year now, we had a gala event to celebrate our first year in May. So, and that's a picture at one of our deployments with some of the local elders. Um, so, so far, 400,000, and we're probably up to about 3,500, but I haven't checked back with the head office yet, so I'm sure there's a little bit, a couple hundred more than that now. But we've taken them to 40 remote communities at the moment, so that's kind of where we are. But it goes to show you just how far we've got to go um, in our goal. The key thing about it is the involvement of the Department of Education in the states. So we have states and we have a territory, Northern Territory is not a state. Um, and the key thing is about getting the involvement in the educational department. So it's not just about going out there to a school and saying, here's a laptop and we think you can use it. It's about working with the Department of Education and getting it built into the curriculum. So the laptops become a replacement for pens and papers, basically. In a school in Sydney, you would have a computer room and are in the rooms. For example, my niece, who's 10, she has 25 computers in her classroom and that's how they work and interact. She had to do a mouse test before she was accepted into kindergarten. Uh, these guys don't. These guys have two to three old machines sitting in a corner and that is their experience with technology. So what we're trying to do with these little laptops is provide them with a tool that they can use as that day-to-day -day interaction tool for learning information. So it's not just some old textbook anymore, but it's a personalised um, little machine. <coughs> so, and as I said, yeah, inclusion in the educational curriculum, that's really, really important with us that we get the teacher buy-in. Um, going out there and giving technology to a school is great, but we need the teachers to come along with us. And we need the teachers to feel comfortable with this as well. So one of the projects, I work as a web systems consultant there, so one of the big projects we have is an educational portal where we get the teachers to come on board and do a 10-week online course where they actually learn how to be what we've defined as an exopert. So the exopert, so this is where local involvement comes into it. So it's not just about a bunch of people sitting in a city having all the resources and the knowledge for these tools, but it's about taking it out to the local communities getting the elders taught up on this, getting the teachers taught up on it, so they're at a level where they're comfortable with being able to use these tools and also to support um, the, the laptops as well. So One Laptop Per Child Australia does not provide technical support for the laptops. The technical support is provided by the Departments of Education. The support for the software on that is the teaching of the activities is provided by the locals and then we have the overarching support from us and also One Laptop Per Child International for deeper questions about that. It's a um, photo there of one of our leading kind of educational researchers there and uh, a local elder talking about the project and giving some laptops up. So as I said, it's an education project. It's not just about giving people laptops, it's about providing people with an education. And by providing them with a better education, we can help to reduce the gap. So that's something that um, the project's really important about. So um, as I said before, we've got an online educational portal for teachers to be certified in using the XOs in the classroom. That's something we're currently working on. We, well, we do have one running, but we're working on making it a lot larger and providing activity planners and stuff like that, that's being built uh, in a Drupal content management system and the modules that we're developing there will be given back to the open source community as well. Uh, local training and skill share for each deployment. So we'll go out, when we have a deployment at a school, uh, One Laptop Per Child Australia will actually go out and do one-on-one -on -one training with these teachers and we'll run training sessions. And we also give the laptops out to the teachers to make sure that they're at a certain level before we then deploy them through the schools. So as I mentioned before, education. Um, these kids, some of these kids, that's their first possession. That's their first toy. And I can't drive that into people like enough in the sense that they don't have 
Uh, they don't go home and they don't have a big toy box. They don't go home and have a computer. They don't go home and have a TV. So this is their first personal possession. So this becomes not just a toy, but it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes an educational uh, tool for them that will stay with them hopefully throughout the years of year si uh, kindergarten to year six. And that's our primary target is primary kids. It's not for high school children. It is for that um, primary years. So getting on to the technical stuff, what is an XO? An XO is what you see there. He's a little laptop. She's a little laptop. I call mine Lisa. Um, it's, it's designed for kids. So it's little, it's very, it's rugged. It has, you know, it's a bit tricky to use a keyboard. It's got two little antennas on it that we call ears. So when we're talking to the kids, we say flip up their ears and then they can hear each other. And they can all communicate together. They work on mesh networking. It's designed for rugged environments. Uh, educational tool is its main purpose and it's a very low cost factor. So 100 American dollars is kind of what they say roughly the price is. In Australia, it comes to about 300 Australian dollars and that is including the cost that it takes to go out and do the deployment and also do the training and that as well. Uh, one laptop per child Australia pays that uh, through sponsorships. We're a non-for-profit startup company. So we get sponsorship by um, philanthropists and we also get sponsorship by uh, companies. And the Departments of Education, which is obviously the government, uh, provides the other half of that funding. So the XOSoft 1.5, which is what you have, there is a one version, this is 1.5, the software. So it's running Fedora underneath it, which is a Fedora 11 base. Um, on top of it, it runs a Sugar interface. Walter Benjamin is the designer and developer of the Sugar interface. He learned that, uh, came together with it from probably about 10 or so years plus, probably more, sorry Walter, probably maybe 20 plus uh, years there of doing research and education with kids and found that this was a great interface for them. I play with this interface and I get completely lost because I'm like, what? And then I see a kid and the kid's just like, oh yeah, that means that and I can do this. And, and it's, it's quite amazing because I was actually quite skeptical of this interface at first, I must admit, and I heavily questioned Walter in public uh, at a conference on it and it's been interesting to see it in the wild and just to see how the kids react to it. But it's got activities, so all these little icons that you can see around there, little different activities that you can run. Everything from mathematics uh, to creating music, to creating artwork, um, to being able to write. There's also like a copy of kind of Wikipedia and stuff on there as well. If you want to develop for it, it's running a Python 2.6 with a Pi GT cam, not a Python developer, as I said, PHP, so just giving this information there. It also runs a GNU compiler collection. And with the 1.5, if you right click on that little XO, you can say switch to desktop and you can drop into a GNOME desktop as well. So as the kids get older, they've also got that ability to kind of go into a normal GNOME desktop interface with Inkspace and a couple of other programs. Uh, the hardware. So that's all the kind of boring spec stuff there. But basically, it's a low cost um, laptop. So I had it in Brighton recently at the um, tech space there and they tried to play YouTube and it's like, well, it's kind of not really designed for playing YouTube on it. It is very much designed for what it is, which is an educational tool. And because we're trying to get battery life out of it and everything else, and we're also trying to keep it at a very um, low cost price, um, it's got, it's not going to run the best video, so it's got the specs that it has there. So uh, power sources that you can connect it up to is a more interesting thing. Um, I don't know, a lot, a lot of you could probably remember some of the first versions that had the wind-up, which they do use um, and use different things like that with the international project. Uh, in Australia, if we don't have it, we, have, we connect it into power sources. What we've done is kind of build a rack so we can connect five of them to ten of them up at one time. Most of our school, all of our schools, not all of them are connected to the power grid. Most of them are running off solar energy and generators. So that's where you're getting your power from there. You can connect the laptops up to them as well directly. Um, so this is my, the, the end of my, my, my slides. Um, because generally when I give this, I do it in very much a question and answer kind of a talk. Because it's the kind of thing that I think sparks. Um, some interesting questions from people. 
Um, but as I said before, it's really about closing the gap for us um, and what we're doing. What we're trying to do is provide uh, rural and remote communities that don't get that ability to have the access to that technology. And we're really trying to, to enable them the same opportunities as their you know, brothers and sisters and cousins, et cetera, do have on the coast. So just because they're in a rural or uh, remote part of Australia doesn't mean that they can't have that. And as I said, it, it can sometimes be interesting because some people go, but Australia's a really wealthy country. And yes, we are. But we also do still have portions of the Australian community that don't have access uh, to the same technology as the rest do. So that's, that's really what we're focused on. We're a bit different from the international projects because we've built it so heavily within the educational departments. So if anyone has any questions or anything about the project, please ask. Let's thank Amy for the talk. <laughs> We have time for questions. Do you, do you issue the, the RPCs to kids on the coast as well? Do you have any sort of program for, for them buying it? No, no, because kids on the coast, <laughs> kids on the coast go home and mum and dad have a Mac. They have a Mac or they have this big fancy, you know, PC. In their classrooms, they've got rooms with 20 to 30 computers. So, if I give them, I give a kid in, a, in, a, in Sydney or, or, or Byron Bay or Brisbane, one of these things, they go, meh, okay. It's not, it doesn't interest them because they've got access to so much more technology. These kids don't. Sometimes this is their first computer that they've ever seen, apart from the old Pentium 2 that's sitting in the corner. So if we were targeting kids on the coast, we're targeting what's not, what is, is above the, the socioeconomic average, is basically. So that's where we've really done. We've really looked at the socioeconomic average and targeted that lower, that lower group. And so do you spread it to whole communities in an area? Or does it just depend on that family's income? No, 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 no. So, so um, with the indigenous communities, uh, if a community, so if the socioeconomic number is per community. So you do not have, in an indigenous community, you do not have a wealthy family. Everybody's poor. Uh, it's, 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 it, you know, everybody's poor, everybody has the same access to water and the same low access to electricity that everyone else does. So we do it uh, per community and we target it per school as well. So we'll pick a particular, we started doing it in the homelands which is called the homelands because it is one of the homelands of the indigenous spirituality. Um, and we'll pick the communities, but we'll do it to numerous schools within that, that community as well. But it is as very much about closing that gap and trying to provide the children with access to technology that they wouldn't see normally. Are the teachers positive about it or are they a bit scared? Or? Teachers are positive about it. Where the teachers get scared is I think where any educational teachers get scared in the sense that they're not technical, the ones that aren't technical. So it's a big thing for them, okay, I've got to learn how to use this. Um, but when they start using it, funny enough, our most popular program is Squeak. So I don't know how many people know that. That's a little, um, kind of like the Turtle lo logo programming language. So it's a little programming tool. So the, the kids can build their own kind of e-toys and stuff within that. The teachers, are, that's why we have the educational program. And the largest part of my job has been developing the architecture and the information architecture and the metadata st structures for the educational portal. Uh, to get that teacher buy-in is very important. So yeah, they are nervous to begin with. So we go and do the one-on-one -on -one deployments and hold their hand, kind of drag them along. More now. Um, why is it that you know, the schools are along the course of 25 laptops and why isn't this incredible inequality? Um, it's historic. Um, it's unfortunate. And the schools are private? Uh, no, these these are all sorry. These are all public schools. These are all public yeah. schools, and they're all community. Very. That's an incredible inequality. It is. It's a huge inequality that exists. And this is why projects like this are really important. Um, and this is why 
uh, some of the work that, that, that recent um, politicians, so Kevin Rudd, who was a recent politician in Australia, got up and recognised what was occurring to the Indigenous population of Australia and actually gave us, uh, acknowledged us for having tax exemptions so we can get more people on board to help us. And things like that are really important. Um, I wish I could give you an answer that, that, that wasn't too political or wasn't too emotional, but I can't. But it, that, that equality does exist, uh, inequality does exist, and a lot of it is just being remote and being isolated as well. So they are remote and they are isolated, but that's also how they've lived and that's also how they want to live. So it's not about going in and saying, you need to change how you want to live. It's about going in and going, let's take something in and help you to at least try and reduce that gap and give you the, the same access. Okay, so I think you have a question. Uh, okay, so, so I have two questions. Two. Um, <laughs> one is, um, I remember, so I've seen Ingrid Marie talk before, so I'd really like um, if you could talk about um, uh, going home with expensive, uh, you know, computing equipment when the, the whole family is quite poor. I remember you mentioning something about power packs. That's an interesting uh, story, if you could recall that. And the yeah. other one is more of a technical question. Um, so they all kind of talk to each other. How do you deploy like lesson plans or, or whatever across? Yeah. Cool, so they, they all use this um, mesh networking, so they all kind of uh, communicate to each other, kind of like by an ad hoc wireless network. So like if you have a computer and your friend has a wireless computer and you can allow them to talk together, so that's how they're kind of, they're doing it. We have this thing called an access server. In Australia we have a different access server build to what international use because we've gone and um, commissioned our own build of it. But the servers have a Moodle instance in there. It's not a Moodle normal website Moodle instance. If you right click on the little X, um, XO on the laptop, it gives, it's one of the things it gives you, if not in there in the settings side of it, is register. And that registers back to the XS server. Because they're running Linux, they're all running the journal, so the X3 journal file system. So every single, so everything you're doing on there right now, I have a log of. Um, <laughs> So all the teachers have that log and that gets reported back to the access server so they can check in and that's how they do it that way. And that's how they communicate so as well. To implement on a non exo basis. So we had a bunch of laptops, like general <laughs> Windows PCs. Is yeah. Can you, can you do some well, the exos the have the register capability and everything built in. I mean, I have done... We had a golf day where we had the XOs, they were just connecting out to the internet and they were connecting through a Windows um, DNS DHCP server, so that can be done. But the actual registering to the XS is, is a particular Fedora build. Yeah, so that, that would have to be that, that server, yeah. But I mean, in a Windows system, it would be an ad hoc net, network is the kind of similar thing to the mesh networking. Um, so, yeah, as, as I was saying before, this is their first possession. So a lot of these guys will go, go home and that's going to be the most technical thing that they have in their house. That's probably going to be one of the more expensive items that they have in their house as well. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't want to be 100% quoted on this because there's, um, you know, I, I can't say exactly what's being done on the ground this second as per the last time I talked to them and it changes day to day, week to week. Um, and I'm very much focused on the web side of things. But basically, um, in certain communities, in certain situations, what they'll do is keep the power packs at the school, so that when there's talk of also about, um, you know, utilising that, so that way, would the kids take the laptops home? Because you do risk the problem of, of uncle or brother or someone like that going, oh, cool, awesome, we can go and sell this for beer or we can go and sell this for, for drugs and that. And as you do in, in any, I believe, community, I don't care if you're, you're rich or poor, that's what happens. Um, so because of that, uh, there is a situation where uh, at some of the schools, we'll keep the power packs at the school, so therefore it's like you have to bring it home. Uh, sorry, bring it back to school. So it's enforcing that this is your educational tool and you need to take care of this and this will kind of help you go along in life. And as I said, it is because sometimes this is some of their first, um, uh, like, technical possessions. Um. Alison, back there. Can I just ask, what was the kids' reaction for the first data? Um, I, I, I should have put more, more photos up, but I'm um, like, 
that's their reactions when they first get it. It really, really is. So that's um, Rungan, who is our managing director of the project. Um, and that's two of the children at the schools. And for the kids, it's amazing because you've got to... These kids don't, like, my niece has three computers in her home and she has an auntie that has four computers and, you know, she has little robot toys and all this stuff. She's so immersed in technology that she takes it for granted. You know, she expects that to be everywhere. She expects people to have that everywhere. These kids don't. So for a lot of them, it's like, oh, my God, wow, look, I can make music on this thing. I can create a picture. And the, um, especially with the indigenous culture in Australia, it's a very art-based culture as well. So the ability to be able to put together a little song or, you know, use it to draw and kind of share that drawing is, is something that they're like, oh, this is yeah, really cool. So we, we get really positive feedback. And it's really quite touching when, you know, you do see the picture of the kids there and they're not just teaching each other, but they're teaching the elders as well. So you'll see, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds teaching like 60-year-old, 50-year-old, you know, seven-year-old elders about how they're doing this thing on the laptop. And these are people that, like, wow, <laughs> you know, because they don't interact in that um, technology world, really. I think, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you also do business outside of Australia, because like, I would imagine that there is a big market. Uh, so I work with one, one laptop per, per child Australia. So just to give you a little bit of the breakdown, you've got one laptop per child international. They take care of everything. Um, however, there's two certified countries in the world. There's one laptop per child Australia and one laptop per child India. And we take care of our own deployments and we take care of how we utilise and the programs that we do. And then one laptop per child international takes care of a lot of the other deployments. So yes, there is... Um, a huge thing outside of Australia and that's where One Laptop Per Child International gets involved and they do those bigger deployments. Um, for me, I've chosen, I've started doing stuff as a volunteer on this project um, a couple of years before I, I started being paid to work on this project this year but I've been volunteering for a while and um, Indigenous Affairs in Australia is something I've always it's kind of very strong to my heart as well. So this particular program uh, I can know a lot about. One Lap Top Per Child International. Um, also, I do a lot of stuff with them and that I couldn't tell you about their deployments and their linking to educational structures within the, those countries. So do, do, do these computers have general internet access? So would the kids be able to do something like Facebook or, you know, I mean, I guess they actually have for Facebook. <coughs> yeah. That they connect into the more few uh, kids which have access to bigger technology on the course. Okay, so uh, how they pretty much connect to the internet most of these kids is through school because they don't have it at home, so they're connecting at the school. Um, the, all the departments of education in Australia are heavily filtered, so things like Twitter and Facebook and a lot of uh, sites and things like that are filtered out of the internet, so they'd have to kind of get around that. But they had the, the whereabouts to get around it, they could. Um, <laughs> the, the use of the machines is very regulated within the curriculum. Uh, but yeah, if, if they went home and they had someone visiting that, that had internet connection or whatever not, they could use them. You can use them to get onto the internet. I take these things to conferences and I use them in um, GNOME to just show people that it can be used in GNOME and I can connect on, on Firefox on there and, and stuff like that. So yeah, there is an internet browser as one of the activities. The gentleman over there. The, the educational possibility is obviously massive. Um, following rollouts, do you see, um, have you got interest from companies who want to develop educational tools for the EXO? Um, and, um, and if so, where do you see that progressing? Uh, companies, no. So it's very much an open source FLOSS project. So it's being run by the community. So all the, um, so, these are, these are a bunch of different activities that you can see around here. That's Pippi, it's a Python um, little language editor. You've got there's Squeak over there that I was talking to you about. There's eToys, um, there's the Alice kind of AI program, there's Turtle Logo. 
uh, development there. There's a, like a Tom Tom kind of music making activity. All these activities are developed in the open source community and they're all supported and, and sponsored by that. Um, and what I mean sponsored is in by the greater community. And certainly if people wanted to get on and, and anyone, so I go around and talk a lot to Python developers and say this is an XO, this is how you can develop more activities. I'm looking at um, porting some of those activities as well to mobile d devices and stuff like that to just extend their reach. Something I'm personally looking at. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not, yeah. so if a company wanted to, yes they could. If you wanted to, yes you could. Um, normally if I do a tech talk, I've got the links up there for where you go, the tutorials and stuff. But if you type, typed in Sugar Labs and you went there, you could download Sugar on a Stick. You can use it on Macintosh, on Linux or a Windows machine. A lot of the teachers have Windows machines in the classroom and they're running Sugar on Sugar on the Stick to interface with the kids. Does that answer yes, your question? Yes, okay. We have time for more one question. I just wondered if you're looking at the levels of attainment or which seniors that go wrong when you deploy to a community. Uh, say that again, sorry. I wondered if you also look at, or some of your team look at the levels of like, which seniors the attainment. Yes. Yes, very much so. So as I said, this is an educational tool. So it's built in with the Departments of Education. So I work, I'm a web systems consultant there. Um, we have, it's uh, one of the photos, one of the ladies who's been a long time researcher, worked with MIT, et cetera, um, in regards to the development of programs and stuff. There's not her and another main gentleman, Crichton, and a bunch of other teachers spread throughout uh, the different departments that work on those number crunches and look at what is the difference when we give these laptops um, to the kids. Uh, and, and as I said, when you're looking at socioeconomic, so a lot of them have lower levels of literacy and numeracy skills than the, the average age on the coast. So that is something that's definitely taken into account when they develop the curriculum for them as well. So that is a big factor. And it's also one of the main, kind. It, it, it's a closing, it's a closing the gap factor, as in by utilising this tool, hopefully we can bring those numbers up. So that is definitely a big focus. Okay. Let's thank AIM again. Thank you very much for coming. Okay.